We live in a constantly changing world where the speed of information is changing how we think and act and connect with one another. When people in a society lose faith in their institutions, in God and in each other, the nation collapses. We need help rebuilding trust and tying it all together. Welcome to All That To Say, a podcast exploring the interrelatedness of all things in long-form conversation. David McIntosh, former U.S. Congressman and co-founder of the Federalist Society, joins Jim Lyon to explore politics, the tight wire of personal faith and public policy, and the things that divide us. David McIntosh, you have a story to tell. I mean, this is the guy who grew up in a little town called Kendallville, Indiana, born yes. in Oakland, but as yeah. a youngster, your family relocated to uh, Kendallville. Your dad passed away, is that right, when you were very young? That's right, when I was five, and my mom moved us back to Indiana where her family is. And so that was home for you. And uh, as you grow up, you find yourself going off to college, but not just down the road at Indiana University, for instance. Where'd you go? Went to Yale College in Connecticut. For a long time, I would just say I went to Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> because nobody in Kendallville wanted to hear the guy from Yale? That's right. Yeah. It was, why didn't you go here? <laughs> and, and, I mean, that seems like a big journey from Kendallville to Yale. Had you been to New England before? Or, I mean, you checked so it out? So my stepfather and mom would take us on family vacations. We traveled to all of the historic sites in the East. And, and I do remember visiting Yale once. But, yeah, as a freshman, I got on a bus and was there on a bus for about 20 hours. By yourself? L by myself. What's your suitcase? Lugged my suitcase about a mile and a half up to the dorms and was nervous. You know, am I going to fit in uh, to this really famous institution? Somewhere along the line, I realized, yeah, everybody else puts their pants on one leg at a time, <laughs> just like me, and yeah. this is going to be fun. And so what would you tell me about Yale, your experience at Yale? What's one good thing about it? Oh, it was great. I was very involved in a debating society called the Political Union. And I met some wonderful friends, lifelong friends there. Um, but the small group that was really most interesting were these sort of eccentric conservatives who I was, I thought I was a liberal Democrat at the time. And they challenged everybody to come to their debates and stand up for what they believe in. It that showed me the power of free and open debate, of ideas being discussed. And then we'd all go out for drinks afterwards. <laughs> and you loved it, though. I mean, you oh, loved yeah. that contest of ideas. And... Uh, very much so. I loved the debating back and forth. I used to try to, you know, score wins more than try to convince people, probably. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> but it, it, was, it was a blast. And you went to Yale for your undergrad and end up going on to the University of Chicago for law school. When you went to Yale, were you intending to go to law school? Yes. Um, so I, I had been inspired, I guess, watching the Watergate hearings to get involved in politics. Right, let's just stop there. I got inspired watching the Watergate hearings, which puts you in that elite class of people who are really interested in public policy. I say. <laughs> no, that's right. Well, I saw, I saw Congress come out and take somebody down who had done the wrong thing as president. And I thought, okay, um, politics makes, uh, will make a difference. Um, so then I also noticed that most of them were lawyers. So I, th I thought I should be a lawyer. Now, my mom in, the, in our little town of Kendallville was the elected city judge, but you didn't have to be a lawyer. She, she was a nurse. So she kept saying to me, you should not be a lawyer. Lawyers don't see black and white. They only see gray. And that bothered her. And that bothered her. Uh, and she could tell you stories about how they would, would say, well, it looks like that, but it's really not that way. And, uh, so she wasn't that happy. Most of my family were in the medical profession, so I, I tell people I was the black sheep that went to, went law, to law school. school. But you landed at the University of Chicago. Yes. And uh, enjoyed it? It was a good move? It was a great move. At about that time, friends at Yale challenged me to think through what I really believed in. Um, don't just accept the dominant culture, which at Yale and most colleges was liberal, um, and liberal to socialist. And so I'd been thinking about that. At Chicago, the professors are unique. I mean, if you've seen some of the movies about law school, they loved the Inquisition, but they mostly wanted you to think on your feet. And I had a couple of incredibly good professors. Antonin Scalia was teaching them. Wow. 
Um, there's another, Frank Easterbrook, who is also a judge. Uh, Richard Epstein, who is, is a really famous law professor now at Columbia. And that was a period for me to really think through what are the fundamental beliefs that I have about government, about law and the rule, rule of law, and how it can bless our society. And so it, it was a, a really fertile time of learning and thinking. And, and then we started a group that has prom promulgated that, the Federalist Society. Um, my roommates uh, teased me that I had a phone growing out of my ear. This was way before <laughs> the internet yeah. um, and, and way before a cell phone. So it was literally the house phone. And I'd spend hours with two of my Yale friends uh, planning out the first conference for the Federalist Society and who we would invite, how we'd run it. And, well, and it, it was a fun I mean, fun I just endeavor. gotta stop right there, the Federalist Society, which is much of the news these days. So give me a, a time frame. What approximate years are you with your school buddies dreaming up the Federal Society? When was this that? This is in the early 80s. The um, early 80s. So it was Ronald around. Reagan's in the White House. Yep. Uh, you're in Chicago at law school. You've got some friends. You're, you've already self-described that you're, you're scrubbing down your own frame of reference, your right. own kind of philosophy of, of public life and public policy, and that leads you to the Federal Society. Tell me about that. What, what in the world were you thinking? Well, um, we noticed at law school that a view of law, that, that it's finite, it, it's created, and, and when you have stability in that law and the rule of law, uh, society flourishes. People can be free, they can follow and do things and settle disputes. But that had been attacked and eroded by a more modern view that said law is really just politics. So we can decide cases based on which group we think is more important. Um, and outcome so, based outcome based rather than than based on rules that everybody agreed to. It'd be like a, a sports event where you'd have a set of rules of how you score a touchdown, but if one team you know was deemed to be disadvantaged, maybe they didn't have to go all the way to the to the zero yard line. They could score a touchdown at the twenty yard line, you know, and, and that would change in the game depending on how it was going. That's the view of law that was predominant at the time. And so we, we started sort of having pizza and debating about, no, what, what is the real meaning of law? What's the tradition in our constitution? How do we interpret what those mean to, as you apply old rules to new problems? And uh, Justice Scalia, then a professor, and jo Robert Bork had a theory that was rep unheard of mostly at the time, but we were convinced was the right theory that we'll look at the intent when the law was passed, when people agreed to be bound by that law and that constitution, and then apply that meaning or intent to today. That should be the definition. As long as the law's on the books, it needs to be understood and effective in the way it was intended at the beginning. That's right, because that's how people agreed to give up their freedom, their liberty, to live in an order. That was the deal, society. kind of like a contract. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so we started propounding that and having seminars. One of the things we realized and did early on, Jim, was if we just marched around and said, this is the way it should be, people might say, oh, that, that's kind of nice. These guys, they're, they're off on their own. We consciously decided to set up a debate, again, this back and forth. And we invited liberals who disagreed with us to come and present their view and they actually loved it because they loved the academic challenge mm -hmm. and the intellectual challenge. And so it, it grew fairly rapidly. Um, then when we all left law school, we missed that, right? It was fun. You had a chance to debate, go for pizza, have a beer. And, and so we started, we expanded the Federalist Society to a lawyers group. And I was lucky enough at that point to be working for Attorney General Meese and he basically said, on your free time, David, yeah, keep building the Federalist Society. At one point, I, I laugh, I felt like an itinerant preacher because I, I would travel from law school to law school and sleep on somebody's couch. Have, have a revival <laughs> meeting <laughs> yeah. about the Federalist Society. About the Federalist Society. And, and did you, was it a debating society? I mean, was it? Yes. So was the Federal Society from its inception a place that invited in diverse points of view or it was a... a 
cheerleaders for the established so order. So there were some principles that we laid out that we believed in. The, that rule of law, that law should be as it was originally understood and applied. But within that, we welcomed people who didn't agree with that. By the way, that's now become mostly the norm. Even liberal law professors will make arguments based on original intent and original meaning. Um, but within it, you'd have traditionalists, people who wanted to use law to further moral values. And you'd have libertarians who said, no, law is really just to make sure people don't use force or fraud against each other. Um, and that's as far as it should go. So we would invite maybe a libertarian, a, a traditional moral view of the law, uh, a liberal, and they had something called critical legal studies, which was sort of the socialist communist view of the law, and have them all come and be on a panel with four and different speakers. it was a scrum right there. Right, right. Fascinating. And then the students got to ask questions, um, which were often the best part as they would go back and forth. It, intellectually, it was just, um, it was like oh, it had to be so a slice of heaven. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, I get that. And of course, you know me, David, I went to law school. I, I'm a wannabe, so I'm not yeah. pretending to have any insight in the law. But um, my journey through law school was, as you described, it was, a, it was a provocation. It was a dare to me to stand up and own my ideas. Oh, that's and wonderful. At, at the time, I didn't like to do that. Right. So I was miserable at the time. Looking back, it was one of the best... Uh, educations I had, but in that context, what you're describing makes so much sense to me. But one thing I learned in law school was that I have to be able to anticipate and psych out my opposing counsel's arguments before right. I get to the courtroom. In other words, yes. if you're going to master your case, you better master your response to the case you think they're going to make. I'm I'm setting you Absolutely up. Absolutely right. You have, you have unpacked in a very straightforward and, I mean, easy to digest way, a concept of originalist thought with the law contrasted to someone who is more, a word I introduced, the outcome-based yeah. uh, interpretation. So what's that argument? As you meet the test of your, defending your ideas, how do you understand the other side's argument? Yeah, I think, so in, in some ways it's um, the, the equity versus justice. Uh, being equity meaning let's do something that is right in the circumstances, even if the law hadn't provided for that. So the, the opponents to that would say, look, if you, if you simply interpret laws the way they were originally written, there are large groups in our society, minorities and other people, that weren't advantaged by those laws. And we should have a law that looks to the outcome how, when it's applied, does it actually help those groups? Now, I would argue, back that our framework does help them because when you set the expectations, people adjust their behavior. So everybody in society can, can conform to those laws and pursue their dreams and their, and their hopes and ventures. If you do equity all the time and change the rules to try to help somebody, then people can't plan and organize their lives around it. Because they don't know if, if they raise their hand, am I one of the people that the court will look at and say, yeah, you should be helped? Or am I somebody that, no, you don't really need the help, so we're not going to rule in your favor? And, and that type of uncertainty leads to people feeling that it's also unfair. And so they don't have confidence in the outcome. And the system can break down, ultimately. Yeah, I mean, that, that right. would be the end result if that were unrestrained. Yes. Okay, fascinating. But I, I just have to bring up... So it's a, a, Opponents of what we believe in, I think they have a good heart, right? They, yeah, yeah, they yeah, want yeah. to help people and see a good outcome. Um, I prefer to say, let's step back and see what the ultimate consequences are. Or would you say, the reality is that an old rule, as you once called yeah. it here, an old rule may not produce the intended outcome years down the road. Right. The answer is not to just arbitrarily change the old rule. It's to intentionally, through a process adjust the law yeah. to meet the need of the future. And, and in our society, we, we have a democracy, a, a republic with democratic principles, um, which means the way you change that is you go back to the people, either some states have referendums or you, the legislature passes a change. And, and that honors the system. Again, people have bought into that social contract. If you have a court that comes in and says, well, 
the legislatures aren't moving fast enough or they're not doing it. We, we know what the right answer is, so we're going to change it. That takes away the people's input into it because in our country, judges typically aren't elected. And so there's no recourse for people to have their voices heard. And what you're describing then is it's kind of a core uh, crucible of the Federalist Society. Yeah. That it's been founded and it still now flourishes today and has achieved great influence by advocating for this particular frame of reference when dealing with public policy. Yeah. Here's the rules. We made the rules. You can change the rules, but you have to do it through a process, give people a voice in those outcomes. Otherwise, we are bound by the contract. And the most authentic one, people that are engaged in that are the ones that will honestly say, and if the rule doesn't do what I think is best, we still have to follow the rule. Um, because the, the overall preservation of the system and the freedom that it's given us is more important than the immediate result. You saw that occasionally with um, Justice Scalia. He, he was a strong Catholic, uh, but it, he would not use the constitutional protections of religious freedom to overturn legislation simply because he thought it was the wrong legislation. It was contrary to his moral order. Right. Yeah. And, you know, that Judge Scalia, of course, became a kind of a conic figure uh, yeah. In, in a representation, almost the face of, of what's sometimes described as originalist legal uh, grounding. But I'm old enough. I'm that old guy that remembers Robert Bork. Yeah. Who, in a day, you know, years ago during the Reagan years, Bork uh, had been the Solicitor General. I mean, that... For Nixon and Watergate. And, I mean, he, and, yeah. he had a very distinguished career. I mean, he was impeccably groomed, you might say, for a Supreme Court seat. Yeah. by his resume and experience, and also his integrity. Uh, you mentioned Watergate. You know, Robert Bork uh, was uh, somebody who found himself in charge of the Justice Department but still had to navigate uh, yeah. his way through all the drama of what the President Nixon asked and so on. In, Robert Bork was proposed as a nominee to the Supreme Court by Ronald Reagan. By this time, you're working at the Reagan White House. Somehow it falls on you to help guide him through that process. That's so I right. got this right? And in my recollection, that, that season of Bork's nomination, and of course, ultimately, he did not make it to the Supreme Court, right. defined today, still today, we're in the wake of, of how Supreme Court uh, processes are viewed and so on. So um, unpack that for me. First of all, I just want to get down to the the bare minimum is you are, you've had to be a young guy working at the Reagan White House and you're suddenly thrown this assignment that's got to be mind-bending. Yeah, Tell I me think, about I that. I think I was 27, 28 years old, oh my pinching myself as I walked through the gates into the White House. Um, yes, what happened there was... Uh, here's a photo of, uh, of President Reagan and Robert right, Bork. There they are. Right yep, next sorry. to each other. Yep. Um, Reagan is my hero uh, as the president. The... So Bork was the, well, you could argue maybe Abe Fortas this happened to, but, but he became a person who was more like a politician being selected for the Supreme Court post than a, a jurist. Prior to that, both sides of the aisle would recognize whoever's president has a right to pick smart, intelligent, legal men and women. Maybe not your mob, the nurse from Kendallville. No, but although she'd have been a great Supreme Court <laughs> justice, she'd have told them like it is. Um, and, and yeah, unless but there somebody was... somebody had a competent resume yeah, and all that. So the Senate would check, do they have that resume? Or in the case of Fortas, they thought he was an alcoholic, and so they were worried he wouldn't be qualified. But Bork, the debate switched to, we don't agree with his view of the law. His legal... His legal jurisprudence. Yeah. And they organized grassroots opposition to it. Um, and... Interestingly, one of the answers that I think hurt him the most was about his faith. Um, I don't know if you remember this, Jim, but they asked him, are you a Christian or what, what church do you go to? And his answer was, I'm a generic Christian, which to many people, particularly in the South, sounded like he really isn't. Yeah. And, and that affected, I mean, Howell Heflin, I think it was, from Alabama at that point flipped Some people that might no have been on his side. And switched. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, he was a great man, a brilliant man. He actually came here to Anderson a few years later when I was running for Congress mm -hmm. and probably is the reason that I won the primary here because 
uh, folks in Anderson were more willing to listen to me and, and find out who I was because, when Robert well, Bork, Bork came. was a and, towering figure. Yeah. And I'm introducing him because he seemed to me, by my recollection, he was a, a premier advocate for the legal theory that you yes. represented in yes. the federal society. So that looked like it was defeated, right, with, with Bork's nomination going down. What it really did was um, force each side to organize politically to pro- propound their views. And in recent years, you've seen opposition to candidates devolve into the mudslinging that we see in a lot of campaigns, right? The the Kavanaugh allegations back and forth. And there's very little attention paid to what do they actually think about the law and how the Supreme Court should operate. Um, and it, it's unfortunate that the whole process has devolved into that type of political mudslinging. Um, one of the things that I think both sides on, on the White House side, picking the people, still feel that they need to get brilliant jurists. And so we, we haven't seen clowns being appointed to That's the right. Supreme so, Court. So in a way, there's an elevated uh, bar, yeah. but the debate isn't necessarily about their competency no. as their perceived views. Their perceived views, and if they can't get a majority based on arguing against the views, then personal attacks. Um, and it seems like it also has kind of neutered the interview process because the nominee now is so circumspect about, well, I can't really comment on that. I can't, right. <clears throat> I can't speculate uh, to avoid the, the crosshair of being pinned on a, an ideological spectrum. One of the things that uh, the Federalist Society members who went into the government and started picking judges realized that you, you couldn't just rely on their answers, right? Because it, it was going to become a political fight, so they might tell you what they think you want to hear. And so it became very important that you look at their record and what they've done in the past, what they've written, what they've said in opinions, and that that sort of narrowed the funnel. You don't you have people with prior experience before they get chosen for the Supreme Court. And maybe strengthening the yeah. the selection process. But at the end of the game, it's really a political scrub uh, yeah. in the Senate these days. Yeah, totally. And, and that's a different. I mean, the Bork uh, journey that you walked way back when you're in your twenties was a pivot. Very much so. It was it was eye opening that the old rules don't apply. And so if we're going to have good people that we want to see on the Supreme Court, we have to prepare to fight the battle the way it's going to be fought. And uh, that has to be challenging in a way, too, because you just described a world of a contest of ideas where people are persuaded in a friendly way. And you just said, but, you know, we had to change. Uh, I'm hearing David said, I have to change the way in which I approach uh, getting to an outcome because of this, what, uh, political... Uh, screen that is now imposed even on Supreme Court nominees. It, that's right. And in my mind, so both for judges and picking judges, and now with my job picking candidates for Congress and Senate, there's almost two factors, right? I still want leaders who are deeply considerate of the fundamentals of our system. Uh, they've thought through what our Constitution means. They've They have a mission in life, to serve and to help people, and they've got a philosophy that, that they will bring with them. But you don't win the contest based on that. So you then have to figure out, in the case of a Supreme Court nominee, how do you persuade 50 senators in what's become a scrum? Or in an election, how do you go to the voters and present somebody? So, And I'm, I'm at that sort of pivot point where we can have influence. And so I... I consciously screen on looking for leaders who are really good people and committed and have that view of what makes America a great political, and political in the small p sense, the, an entity that will preserve liberty and freedom and opportunity for everybody, and yet can also survive or win in that mm-hmm. open the contest that's more like a sports game. Where the players aren't always uh, as noble as you might want them to be, I suppose. No. And, and you, so I was reading a book called uh, Rules for Reformers. It's a take on the Lewinsky Rules for Radicals, um, written by a Christian pastor. And his point was 
some of the tactics they use, we have to be ready to use. And, and he, in a biblical sense, pointed to Joab, who was maybe not a, a faithful believer, but he <laughs> served David, who was God's chosen king. And David had, had advantages with Joab leading his armies, so we have to use the tactics. But we always have to ask ourselves, where's the line? And we, we can't use tactics that, that don't serve God and don't honor God. That, that to me, is a limiting... That's the tension. Yeah. I mean, it's a real tension. Yeah. So, uh, and what it means is that the ends don't justify every means. And some people in politics believe the ends are everything. You mentioned earlier that Reagan was a hero, a heroic figure for you. You worked in the White House when he was president. Someone that... Uh, I've seen some photos with you by his side, just like uh, Judge Bork. What was, what was it about Reagan that uh, struck you and, and still creates that sense of admiration these years on? That's a great question. Um, uh, one, his view of America, uh, and he, he was an optimist, a believer that America would always be good and a force for good, is attractive to me. I, I, growing up, as you mentioned at the beginning, a little kid in Kendallville, Indiana, riding my bike up and down the streets and dreaming big dreams. Um, and and that's, that, that's the America that I love. Um, and they were, they were, we were all working families. There was maybe one wealthy family in town who endowed all of the good <laughs> things, like the swimming pool and the community yeah. center. Um, and, and everybody else would look after each other in oh, that there community. You are. Oh, they found <laughs> the, the picture yeah. with me. Yep. Yeah. So I have to tell you, Jim, when, when that picture was taken, it was the first time I met him in person. And I'd been working for him for about a year because later in the administration, the junior staff didn't see the president that much. I couldn't say a word. <laughs> you were speechless. <laughs> I was speechless. I, I had to really force myself, hi, Mr. President, um, because I thought so much of the man. Um, and I, I think he was conscious of his role as well, um, that, that he knew that he stood for something larger than himself, larger than even uh, the office of president the, the, for the country. And, but he was very, very gracious. Uh, later after that picture was taken, he came over to the Federalist Society at one of the last things he did in office. Uh, and we were backstage and, and there was some show tune playing and he was dancing <laughs> and, and it was, um, and then he got on stage and it was the dignified Ronald Reagan right. that we but, all know. But he could be accessible and personable. Yeah. Uh, even as he was commanding at moments. So I'm hearing you say you, you were drawn to his optimism. Yes. Any th other characteristic? Um, uh, well, his belief that good policy is good politics. That and, and he never did what he thought was the wrong thing to try to get a political advantage. And that moral, that ethic, uh, um, I admire incredibly. I've tried to apply it in my life. Um, but it drew me to him because... I knew he was sincere in wanting to do the right thing. He was authentic to you. Yeah, very well, much you, so. You saw him up close and personal. Yeah. And I just have to ask that. I mean, it seems like such a long time ago, in a way, a lifetime ago, uh, that we framed our public square in the kinds of ways you are. Talk to me about your sense of the world changing from your entree to the Reagan White House till today. Yeah. Still very much you are in the middle of things, uh, not at the White House per se, but still uh, speaking into the world of Washington, D.C., which speaks into all of our world. Just what, what's your reflection on how uh, all the presidents, there's been George H.W. Bush and then the Clinton era and George W. and the Obama era and uh, the Trump era. What do you see in that trajectory? So I'm still very much the optimist. Um, part of what I see today in particular, as younger people tell me, the old Reagan slogans are worn out and let's try new. I, I realized something that actually Whitaker Chambers wrote in a letter to Buckley that each generation must find its own language for eternal truths. And I realized we're going through that now. The, the new younger generation, millennials and those younger than them, they're finding their language for truth that is the same truth I believe in but spoken differently. And... You know, as we get older, we start thinking, oh, these rascals, these young people, they don't know what they're talking about because it's a different language. Um, so I'm an optimist because when I, I delve into it and I spend time and I, I'm surrounded by young people on my staff, 
Um, and I love listening and understanding where they're coming from and realizing they're asking the same questions I did as a, as a young kid in, in law school all the way through working with Reagan and finding their ways of expressing those truths. Now, I think we've had different styles of leadership, right? We've had um, Bill Clinton was very much a, a man of the people, kind of a, a rascal at the same time, and he was flexible in what he would do. So when Republicans, and, and I was part of it in Congress, came to power, he worked with them and shifted his agenda to include some of ours but also some of his. Uh, you then had, after that, um, George W. Bush, who ended up not really being interested in a lot of domestic policy, but viewed his calling to protect us from terrorism um, and stand that up after 9-11. But he, he lost touch with people. They, mm -hmm. they just didn't connect with him. He didn't think he needed to connect with them, which is a failing, actually, I've realized, in, in people who hold political office. In a democracy, you've got to go back to the people that you represent. There has to be the a relationship of a kind. That's right. Yeah. That, they give you the moral authority to do things in, in a democracy. So you've got to have that relationship and stay in touch with them. Um, I thought when I started in Congress, I would write great legislation. And then I quickly realized, no, three quarters of what I do is communicating with people, going back home and reporting on what <laughs> we're doing, listening to them, taking those ideas back to Washington. And, and maybe a quarter of it was working on good policy and, and moving the ball forward. And then Obama, you know, he inspired us all when he was elected, if, whether you voted for him or not, mm -hmm. um, be, for two reasons. One, as the first black president, that was a statement about our country, right, that, that everybody has the opportunity. You know, the, the little white boy in Kendallville, like I was, had an opportunity, but now the little black child in the urban inner city, he can look at the president and say, I can do that too. Yes. Right? right? And that was a tremendous move forward for our Great country. Great threshold. Great threshold. Um, he also campaigned on kind of reducing partisanship when he got there. And I, I, I've heard different reasons why people think he did this. He didn't really follow through on that um, and let Congress, which is much more partisan, set the policy agenda. They wrote the health care bill, for example, with his name on it. But, but Congress really did it, and right. the Democrats said, we don't need Republicans, so we'll just do it on our own. Um, so he, he missed that opportunity, let's put it that way, to, to move us past partisanship. And then, then Trump, right, who we didn't support at the Club for Growth, where I work now, in his primaries. And then when he became president, decided we had to work with him for different things like the tax cut bill and, and the repeal of Obamacare, deregulation, a lot of our agenda in the economic side. And I've thought a lot about what happened with him because there are a large number of people, many of my friends, who were turned off by his style. It used to be this, I wish he wouldn't tweet. But it was also a style of always pushing the battle. But there's a large segment of people in our country that are probably like many of my friends from Kendallville who felt nobody in Washington is speaking for them. And ironically, Donald Trump, the billionaire developer from New York City. An unlikely ally. An but, unlikely ally. Yeah. But he, he gave voice to their concerns. And, and he also did something that I actually wish I admire in politicians. I didn't expect it of him, but I admire it. Um, he made promises. So he campaigned on specific things to, to do. He fought for those, even if he didn't win, he fought for them. And so he kept his promises. It was almost like he was checking them off. And you might not like all of the promises, but, but I, I admire somebody who thinks about leading in that way. And my hope is Republicans, whether they're Trump Republicans or not, will bring that ethic back into, into how our party... I, frankly like to see both parties do it. Um, <laughs> It'd be nice for everyone. Yeah, if everyone stood did by it. their words. Um, yeah, because, I, and I think mostly on the Republican side, right? And so it's self-criticism. I think we lost that in with prior leaders who campaigned one way and then when they got in office, it might have been hard to do, but it looked like they gave up on their promises. 
But the president, uh, Mr. Trump, I mean, he he talked about balancing the budget in four years, and it doesn't yeah. seem to me like he was really working that side of it so well. On our economic issues, the spending side has been terrible. You've, the Republicans and Democrats have both really saddled our country with a huge debt that, that at some point will be an enormous problem that will hopefully will have grown more so it'll be easier to solve. But if if somebody called the debt today, we'd be in yeah. deep kimchi. <laughs> and I mean, that kind of brings me to what you're doing today. There's so much, David, about your life that's fascinating. We've kind of jumped over Congress. I want to go back there. But today, you're at the Club for Growth. And uh, you've been uh, leading at the point for the Club for Growth. Tell me about that. You know, its, it's stated purpose is to uh, advance the cause of some of these ideas, these yeah. what I'll call conservative principles, especially on economics. That's right. Uh, tell me about it. So it, it started as a group um, that wanted to contribute to candidates who believed in what we call it pro-growth policies, but free markets, um, lower spending, lower taxes, less regulation, uh, in general, finding solutions to problems in the, in the marketplace of people doing it rather than building up government programs. So in education, for example, we were strong supporters of sending the money through the parents and they can send it to public schools or they can send it to private schools and then have that market discipline and increase the quality of the education for everybody and create opportunities for everybody. So uh, we started as a smaller group, grew over time. I've been there now six years and along the line away came this notion that's called super PAC, that, that groups can collect money and then spend advertising in campaigns to pro help somebody get elected. And so right now, we, we look mainly for champions of those principles that might not have a chance of winning. But if we come in, we've got about 10,000 members who will write you know, $20 mm -hmm. checks mm -hmm. up to a couple thousand dollar check, the maximum. And then we have a super PAC that will also come in and run ads. And I'm very proud of the people that we have identified and, and helped elect. Um, you've got everywhere from Ben Sass and Pat Toomey on the, the Trump question to um, Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio. We're all people that Club for Growth uh, took from nowhere and helped get elected. Because even though you just described a, a, a class of senators who have mm -hmm. very differing views about President Trump, right. but you have come alongside them because they all share your economic uh, uh, approach. That and the limited constitutional and, and, government. And, okay, and, and yeah, the conservative too. principles, right. Yeah. And, and these are, Club for Growth comes alongside people seeking federal office. Yes. Not in state races. Not in state, although in January, my board authorized us to look at governor's races. And part of that, we were, we've noticed in COVID, for example, governors had much more authority than senators. And so... I don't think we'll get into every governor's race, but we'll look for people who champion those principles and, and try to help them succeed and win. Now, for me personally, um, so when I, I was interviewed for the job, a couple of the board members very much did not want us to do social issues. Don't engage in abortion fights. Uh, don't get involved in immigration and a lot of those issues. And they knew of my faith. And so they sat me down and said, David, nice talk for 45 minutes and then the question came up. Uh, what will you do to lead the Club for Growth on these social issues? And and I said, my faith is really important to me. It, it's the most important thing in my life. But I also will honor what the board has set out for the mission of the Club for Growth. We will stick to these economic and, and conservative government principles and not engage in those battles, even if I have a view about what the right thing is. And so they were satisfied with that. And, and I believe that's my role because that, that's what the board has set out for me to do. Um, interestingly, somebody wrote an article after I, I went through that interview and pointed out that Club for Growth candidates actually have a better right to life score than the national right to life candidates. Just, and, and I think it's because a worldview of limited government gets you to the right answer in a lot of other questions as well. We just don't ask about it and, and don't talk to candidates about it. 
But the fascinating thing for me, Jim, I, I thought I was getting back into politics and policy and into the battles that we were talking about. About six months into it, I, I was praying about what I should do and had this strong sense that God was telling me, yeah, yeah, that, that's what you do. You're the head of that. But my mission for you, David, is to no longer think about yourself as a politician. He had to wring out of me wanting to run for president someday. Um, I want you to identify and nurture and mentor and help elect a new generation of leaders. And I love that definition of my job because it, it lets me get to know these men and women, help them as they're starting out, pass on the lessons and the mistakes that I've made so they don't make the same mistakes. Um, and it's very fulfilling to me. A friend of... As you know, Jim, we talked about Congress. I tried to come back after I lost. Mm -hmm. And a good friend of mine, we were praying about it, and I can't remember the scripture verse, but it's one of the ones where after um, Elijah lights the, calls down, God mm -hmm. lights the, the uh, altar. Prophets of Baal. And, Prophets yeah. of Baal. He then, and then comes out of the cave where he's been hiding. There's a little scripture that says, and God then sent him to Damascus to anoint the king and a couple of other places. So that was the scripture that my friend said, I've, I've got for you, David. At the time, it made no sense to me. What, what does that have to do with me running for Congress, right? Going to Damascus and anointing people. But I realized um, after I took this job well into it, that scripture was pointing me to this mission of trying to help elect a new generation of leaders. So... I want to ask about that, but to help our our listeners, uh, our audience understand a little bit of your trajectory. Yeah. After after you worked with the Reagan White House and then alongside Vice President Quayle during the George H. W. Bush years, you found yourself running for Congress and represented uh, Central Indiana. Yes. For three terms. Yes. And and then decided to run for governor uh, in Indiana. So that required you to step out of your yeah. congr congressional race that year, and. And uh, Mike Pence stepped into that seat, as I recall, at that time. But uh, the governor was a race was a close miss. I mean, uh, yeah. And and so then that caused you to retreat from a public office for a season, uh, pri yes. practicing law. Yeah. Hey, anybody that went to Yale and University of Chicago Law School's got that down. But then you you decided to make another pass on running for Congress again. That's right. Same neighborhood. Uh, but really, really narrow. I mean, what was it like? Less than a thousand votes, and yeah, yeah, a half million about, votes cast or something. Uh, and and the attack on me then, because I'd been in Washington practicing law, was that I really wasn't from Indiana anymore, um, which hurt because I, I view myself very much as a Hoosier. Um, but it it I, I learned to appreciate the Garth Brooks song, "Thank God for Unanswered Prayers," <laughs> right. <laughs> Because then he led me into this position, um, and and I, and it was that second defeat that really made it clear to me: no, that isn't what I have in but mind for. Had you. to be a dark night. Oh yeah, because your dreams. I mean, uh, David, in the 1990s, you were featured in a book about uh, how many were there? Six, seven Six. of the brightest and best up and coming uh, voices, and uh, to have that door closed then, uh, I know that had to be a hard blow. But you. It became a doorway for you, right? And and that brings us to your faith, because uh, you have been on those on that roller coaster of political life, and everybody it seems to me who gets into public life has a roller coaster ride. And that's right. And your faith is something that you've already attested as a key part of who you are. Tell us about that. What's that journey? Take me to the beginning. Okay, great. Um, well, it actually links into this, this desire to argue about things, right? <laughs> okay. Um, so when I was in high school, my best friend was a strong believer in a, in a local Baptist church, and my aunt would, had a strong faith. Um, so my friend would debate, get me debating about um, transubstantiation. You know, is the bread actually turned <laughs> oh, wow. into the body of Christ? Well, <laughs> <laughs> and, or, or is it a symbol? How and old are you? I'm, I'm 16, 17. Talking about transubstantiation. I know, exactly. Yeah, we were in the nerd class, right? Um, <laughs> Good. And, but, but I love that debating back and forth. So he said, come to my youth group and, and do that. And I did. And then eventually 
I, I sort of <laughs> the organizer in me said, well, our church doesn't have a youth group. Why don't, and neither does, in, in the little town I grew up in, literally within a four block area, radius of my house, there were 12 churches. It was near downtown and there was a little church with every denomination. So I found friends in high school from the different churches and, and we started a non-denominational youth group. A pre-federalist society. A pre-federalist <laughs> society, that's right, to talk about God and read the Bible. Um, and I've ran into one of the parents who agreed to chaperone us, and I, I've thanked them so much for that. Um, and, and they said, well, we have to admit we had some mixed motives. We, we brought along our younger children, and we wanted to see show them high school students who believed in God. <laughs> and, and so we were happy to host you and, and help you do it. But that... Changed my heart, right? It wasn't just an intellectual argument at that point. Um, and planted seeds that were really important. But then when I went on to college, to Yale, I went to the church there for about a year. It was dry and dead. And partying and staying out late at night was more fun. So I stopped going. Didn't go through law school. And then when I graduated, I wanted to go back to sunny California, where, where I'd been born and, and lived there. So I was in Los Angeles by myself, didn't know anybody, and I think God planted this idea. You're an adult now, David. You need to do adult things like starting to go back to church. And so I thought, well, I don't know about a church. I'll just walk down the street, and the first one I came to, I'll try that out, and if that's no good, I'll go to the next one. Um, literally, it was Brentwood Presbyterian was a church. Went to a service, came out on the patio, bright, sunny, beautiful California, was surrounded by young people, my age and, and a couple of college students, a couple of, who are you? You're new. Um, come tonight. We run the youth group program. <laughs> and, and suddenly that was my friend group. And, and so I was back in church doing that. And it was during that period that I, I took it seriously and gave my life to Christ and, and really decided I wanted to live for him. Um, and then, and that was just the beginning, right? Because had a lot of barnacles that he needed to knock off, <laughs> and still, yeah. Needs well, to but, knock off. but the journey started in a real right. way for you then, yeah. and here you are still yeah. uh, walking that path. Very much. So. And and of course, you're, David, you're a really smart guy, and your your analysis of of the law, of public policy, of economic theory, of uh, history, of uh, trajectory. I mean, there's so much there that bears witness to your your mind. And at the same time, that mind is operating in your, in your sphere of faith too, because you're, you're not just accepting uh, a mythological story. You, you have calculated the legitimacy, the historicity, and the, and the viability of the gospel of Jesus, and you, you wrestle with its demands. And these worlds have to collide sometimes, where you're your deep faith and acknowledgement of the Lordship of Christ comes into an intersection where another yeah. car is driving, which is the political side and, and the world you actually live in. Do you ever find those in tension? Are there moments where you think like, man, I don't know if this, this philosophy of public life or, or political theory that I've embraced is congruent with my sense of Jesus or do they actually feed each other? How do you see right. it? Right. In my life, they've, they've fed each other. Um, although I remember one time in, when I was uh, a congressman and, and a young man came up to me in, at a parade or something and he handed me this bracelet that said, WWJD, what would Jesus do? So I was wearing that and, and one of my colleagues who was also a believer but a little bit of a, a smartass <laughs> said, David, Jesus definitely wouldn't be in Congress. <laughs> <laughs> if that's the question, if that's the you question, gave the wrong answer. <laughs> that's right. Um, and, and, you know, in many ways he's right. What, what I end up, there are times, right, where the answer seems so clear to me in the worldly sense. Um, a strategy to, to win a race, a strategy to push forward an idea that, that I'm convinced is a good idea for people. Um, and yet, you read then a, a passage in Scripture that talks about um, a very different view. 
free market economics is not embedded in the Bible, right? Neither is being a Republican. And, and so you have to take these things that we, we do and we engage in, my life has been dedicated to in the world, and make sure that they're also aligned with the biblical principles that are, frankly, larger than that. The benefit of doing that for me has been in the losses, right? Um, we might lose a, a legislative battle or we just lost the presidency in the Senate in the election. And what God has given me out of that is a great sense of peace that, yes, you were doing what I called you to do, but I have a different outcome. And it's a peace knowing that the end of the story is, is written by him. And it's a glorious end for all of us. But there's no guarantee along the way that everything is going to work out and, and turn out the right way. So knowing that, that his will will be done allows me to accept losing um, and, and give him the credit for when we win, right? Um, one of the things that I've, I've sort of adopted as a model motto um, when somebody comes up to me and says nice things um, <laughs> is to tell them, Anything good that you see in me is from God. The rest of it is a selfish guy who wants to promote himself. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, well, God is the author of every good and perfect gift. Yeah. And the rest of it comes alongside right. and hopefully can be polished. Well, the amazing thing is he loves us so much in spite of all of that, or including all of that, really. Um, we had been talking earlier, and he's been working on me in, in personal relationships with these members of Congress, young people in my church that I've, I've developed good friends with, to learn to love in the way he loves. Um, and, the, and the scripture tells us to love others as we love ourselves, um, which is, is a good thing. But I, I feel this challenge to go beyond that, and, and which means even when you're ignored or you're thwarted or, or just continue to, to love them for who they are. And which is what he does, right? We, as believers, we can pray and call on God's help, but then we go back about our business and we don't really pay attention to him until the next time we need him. <laughs> and one of my friends said, we're living on God's credit card, right? <laughs> That's right. But, but his love never stops. And, and so that, that's been his challenge for me. Do you think that, you know, the, the political tenor of our time seems to me to be so stressful, I mean, there was a day when I loved to watch the news. Yeah. And honestly, I found times where I just have to turn it off. In fact, uh, last November, there was so much drama that uh, I decided to put up a Christmas tree in my house just as a diversion from the, what shall I say? The, That's wonderful. You know, the, <laughs> all the boxing going on right. uh, on the news. Right. Right. And, it, and I'm, I'm longing for a little bit more grace in the debate. Uh, yeah. I don't want to lead the witness here, David. <laughs> we'll just say... No matter how deeply people are alleged to an idea or an outcome, to be able to be gracious uh, and to extend grace to people who may see it differently or maybe even have thrown a punch at me right. is so much what's needed in the political uh, debate right now. It totally is, and, and you don't see it, right? Because the, the ad hominem, the personal attack, is what works in the media, right? It, it sells shows and, and makes for good TV ads and uh, campaign ads. But, the, but we need that grace. Um, we, in order to get anything done, we need to show respect for our opponents. And, and I, I genuinely believe everybody that I've encountered in, in political office, well, almost everybody, let's put, I'm sure there's some <laughs> exceptions, but whether they're Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative, they, they're in their heart is to try to help people, or the Madisonian concept to pursue their ambitions by helping people. Um, and, and so when you recognize that, even if you disagree with them vehemently, you can recognize they're, they're trying to do what's something that they believe is good. Um, and I, I try to look at people that way. We are in the business of winning races, so if you looked at all of our ads, there are probably some very hard-hitting ones that people would feel, well, David didn't really apply that principle all the way through there. Wasn't so gracious, maybe. Right. Yeah. And that's the tension. Yeah. And 
as you're thinking about that and the future of the conservative movement, you have been a an influential figure, David, and still are today in the conservative movement and in the Republican Party. And, you know, I think everyone's kind of senses we're at a, you know, we're in an unsettled time where there's a, uh, things might go this way or that way and so on. How do you see the future of conservative politics? I mean, is there a face? Is there a frame? Is there anything uh, that you imagine will be that will rise up out of this present stew? Or will it be more of the same? What do you think? I have a hope uh, for that, Jim. I, I think it's an uns unanswered question right now. And, and we are at one of those inflection points um, typically, it happens when the party loses the White House. Where do we go? What's what's our direction? And I, I've just made a talk down at the Conservative Political Action Conference in Florida on this, arguing for unity, at, at least among conservatives. But there are two distinct elements there. there there's the somewhat the old guard, but the, the people who were in conservative politics around a set of ideas. We talked a lot about them. Limited government, uh, more freedom in individual liberty. Many of them are there for out of their faith for protecting life and, and preserving those rights. Then there's a group of people that, that I see Donald Trump having brought into that coalition who weren't really engaged in politics. They're, they're working men and women, folks like you and I know in Anderson and Kendallville and, and all throughout this country. And yet they feel disrespected by a lot of what they see happening in, in the dominant culture. Um, I, I used the line that they stand for our flag and kneel for their God. They, they want to love America, see, view America as great and having been a great country, want to hand that on to their children. And many, many of them have a strong faith and, and want to live out in their community, make it a better place to live, contribute to that way. He brought them into the Republican coalition because they felt nobody else would respect or listen to them. The old guard is a little bit elitist, right, and, and can tend to look down on them. Um, I, I, I have to be careful. I mean... I've been in both worlds, right? I, I, yes, right. And, and you went from Kenneville to Yale. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so my call was, let's unite. Um, and when we do unite around principles, then that creates a force that can bless everybody in the country, not just ourselves, not just Republicans, not just conservatives, but, but truly be a blessing to everybody. And so that's my vision for what can come out of this soup. It may not happen, um, but I, I'm going to at least spend whatever life God gives me more of to try to promote that and push that for that. I'm hearing you say that you, your, your hope for your party is one where it coalesces around those ideas and, and gives voice to gives those Gives voice ideas. to them, but also recognizes part of what people are longing for is leadership for our, that loves our country and, and everything, the culture that we have, and it, not just in a principled sense, but in, I, I want our country to be great. Um, and, and I think we can achieve that. Interestingly, um, I sent a copy of that speech to a young man that I've become really good friends with, who's on the other side of the aisle. Uh, we met at, a, at an event, and he leaned over and said, I'm not really one of you. I'm a moderate Democrat, was the label he did. Um, fascinating, wonderful friend. Um, and we, we've we gotten to know each other. I, I actually think we believe in pretty much the same thing, although he wouldn't put it in religious terms, and, and I would. Um, but he challenges me. His, his mixed race, his dad was black and his mom was white. And I didn't even know that until he told me, right? Because <laughs> I'm just looking at him as a, a here's a, good-looking guy that seems smart and I want to talk to. Um, but he's, when the whole Black Lives Matter came up, he said, well, David, you don't think you're a racist, but have you ever considered there might be some unconscious racism there? And I'd never considered that at all, right? Mm -hmm. but, uh, but his question prompted me to, to look and think about that, and I realized it's a heart matter, that it, how, it, and that's what we have to, to get to, of, of loving people regardless. Um, and so 
One of the things that I cherish in that friendship is somebody that will look at what I'm doing on the Republican side and then give me feedback for what it sounds like to the rest of the people. Perspective, the lens. He liked the speech, so I was happy about that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but I mean, right there, you're illustrating a really important principle, again, that seems somehow lost. You know, people long for that, that snapshot, just what you gave. David McIntosh powerful and influential voice for conservative bent in the Republican Party, and some other guy uh, who... Ty is his name. What's his name? Ty. Ty. Ty so, and there's Ty, who has a different allegiance, yeah. uh, but you're in relationship in a healthy debate and contest of ideas that sometimes nudges both of you, one way or the other. I mean, right. I'm right, guessing right, right. he might say the same thing. I'm so glad to have David alongside because he helps me hear myself. Uh, I hope he would say different that. Lines. That'd be well, nice. But I mean, which brings us to your, your mentoring thing, back to kind of your club for growth. You're, you're in a season of your life now and in a place where you can actually uh, help influence and mentor and form a new generation of leaders. And somebody even like Ty might be in the mix right. uh, to learn right. principles no. of, of how do we... You mentioned that right after Biden won, who he enthusiastically he supported. supported. I said, do you want to get a job with them? And I, I, don't, I can't call them up and say you could, but I can tell you how it's done. <laughs> and, yes. and we're actually working on a different project. So he said, no, I'll do that. The, well, the, but, it's, but that's, that's right. what people that's what I do. For. I'm thinking about someone like Ty. Yeah. How can I help them in their career? How can I make their life fulfilling. Um, and for me, it ends up making great friends, right? And another one is a, a really good friend, a new congressman from North Carolina, a fellow named Ted Budd. We, he went to seminary and then went into business. We share the faith. We get together once a month and we talk about life. Um, and then we talk about politics and what's going on in Congress. Um, and I see him as a, a future senator, maybe someday a candidate for president. And, and yet what, what I realize our friendship is about is more man-to-man. How do right, we right. support each other? Soul to soul. Soul to soul. Because our days here are numbered. <laughs> right. And we're all marching somewhere. Uh, and as we are, uh, we have to have that long view. And I, I just was thinking as we were talking about you and Ty, I don't know if you I'm sure you've seen it. There's a a very popular photograph at the dedication of the African American Museum in D.C., where uh, George W. Bush is seated in a chair and Michelle Obama is standing behind him. I think President Obama is, you know, at the edge of the picture at the podium. But she has she's she's standing behind George W. Bush and she's leaning with her arm around his shoulder and they're laughing. That's wonderful. And, but, but that image was retweeted and reproduced a thousand times because there's, I think, a heart cry in the country for the sense of personal connection, even across divides. And everyone would know that uh, Barack Obama and George W. Bush were on opposite sides of so many things. Uh, And yet somehow they overcame that. And and there you are with Ty. uh, and, And helping other young leaders appreciate the value of that, that relational intersection that does not compromise your views, but can polish them. I mean, uh, we go on about that. But uh, 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 props to you, David, for wow. pouring into that, and it also springs. It. it springs out of a uh, faith because uh, that's where. What would that is your bracelet? What would Jesus do? He'd be uh, giving life to some others along the way. Yeah. Well, that's right. That's right. And challenging them, perhaps, at the same well, time. Stretching them. Stretching them. I think them. those disciples would say that Jesus <laughs> really kind of pushed our buttons sometimes. Yeah, took us out of our comfort zone there. <laughs> That's right. Um, no, and, to, and for me, uh, uh, one of the verses that has really become one of my life verses is in Romans, but it, it's, we aren't given the spirit of fear, right? I think fear creates animosity and distrust and dislike and tribalism of viewing people as different than us. But we're given the spirit of sonship, that we can cry out, Father. Mm-hmm. And, and that, to me, has been a, such a blessing in my life that I can cry out to him as Father, probably because I lost my father. Um, but to then share that with others, that, that they have a Father in heaven who loves them, adores them, and wants to bless them. For sure. I have to ask you about a whole other little chapter. Yeah. Uh, you're in Congress, and that's a whole great uh, 
journey. Uh, you and I were reflecting earlier today about I visited you once in D.C. and you took me to lunch in the house dining room. I mean, I, I was agog uh, to be walking in there and you were just, you were glad handling, I mean, in, in your very <laughs> elegant way, the other people in the room. And uh, I, I remember you pointed out uh, was uh, young, I think it was uh, young Patrick Kennedy or yeah, uh, Joseph Kennedy was a was representative there. at the time, and he was over at this table. And then over here, he says, "Oh, Jim, come on over here. Why don't you meet my friend?" And it was Sonny Bono, yes, <laughs> which took classmate my, of mine, put breath away. <laughs> yeah, uh, and and then for sports fans, Steve Largent was there. That's was, right, uh, yeah. a, a Seattle sports fan guy right. for sure. It was, I mean, it's such a rarefied um, environment where suddenly, I don't know, there's a certain kind of like. Wow, these people are real. Here they're all dining together. Uh, again, a kind of camaraderie across the aisle, uh, d different views. You chaired a, a very influential subcommittee while you're in the House. You, you were um, in good standing with the leadership at the time, yeah. you know, the speaker yeah. and all that, which gives you some uh, position, even though you may not be the senior member. And uh, you're chairing a House committee. You're, you're at the dais, you know, processing testimony, uh, managing that uh, dynamic. Uh, I think all of us can imagine a visual of of a congressional subcommittee and that, I don't know, they always seem to be kind of like curved desks. Uh, yeah, and, and, and then there's a table down in the middle and uh, so on. With the members peering down. That's right, yeah, turning <laughs> down. And uh, I played that game in the Washington State Legislature, which is yeah. you know, like a, yeah. a shadow of what happens in D.C., but I, I can comprehend it. And... That's, a, that's one side of the coin. But then you left Congress and found yourself practicing law and becoming an advocate for people who had to appear before Congress. And, yeah. and even found yourself with some high-profile clients, uh, like a Major League Baseball player, for instance, yes. and, accused of taking performing-enhancing drugs. And, and then you find yourself not peering down but looking up. You're at the table right. uh, in the well. And actually one row back, right? Because my client is up at the front having to testify. Uh, who's that, Rafael? Rafael Palmiero. Oh. Um, and so, great guy. Did you have any sense of juxtaposition there? Tell me about the experience of, wait, I used to sit up there, now I'm down here. And it's not that either is superior to the other. They're just different hats to wear. They're different hats. Um, honestly, what I was thinking at the time was, this is theater, right? And and I knew that as chairman, too, we're... we're we're conducting this hearing, but it, in some sense, it's theater to drive a point to the larger national audience. And in this case, we we had counseled Raphael answer the questions truthfully. Don't ever say something that is not true. Uh, but they're going to want to know whether you think steroids have a place in baseball. So say that. that that's a subjective. That's a subjective view. But that's the main purpose they have for this whole hearing. They wanted to. It's not whether you're guilty is to pull that out. And at the time he made the statement, there's no place for them, I've never used them. And you might remember the history, four or so, five or months later, he tested positive. Um, so we then represented him in a different battle to convince the congressman not to refer him as a perjurer. Because he's under oath. Because he was under oath. And literally, it, it, and I believe it to be true, he, I think he said the right, truthfully that he had never used them, but then did decide to use them. And I, so my role then became an advocate behind the scenes to talk to Henry Waxman, who we were on the opposite side of everything, and to the chairman, Tom Davis, and say, here's a guy that, and this is what happened. Do you want to destroy his life? Or, or do you really right, need to? Right, right, right. And we went through the record and convinced them and, and they said, no, we don't, we don't need to make an example of him. So and that, that's an example of what I did a lot as lawyers. I, it was, what does my client need me to do to tell the truth, but in a way that helps them to get out of trouble? Well, a lawyer's an advocate, isn't that? You know, yeah. in some parts of the English-speaking world, that's, yeah. that's actually the that's professional name. It also taught me, Jim, to be a servant. You know, I... I, I wanted to be a leader, um, but but the, being a, a lawyer for clients and, and understanding what they need as compared to what I need helped me a lot. Fascinating. That. And would you say that your role as a congressman, I mean, I think people from the outside look at that whole transition. Someone's in Congress for a time, then they become a lobbyist. Lobbyist is a kind of pejorative in many right. people's view. 
And yet, you just described a conversation with Henry Waxman, as someone you had served in Congress with, uh, the value of relationship and familiarity seems to me like not necessarily a wicked thing. What would you say? No, I think that's that's exactly right. And it, it what what you have as a lobbyist is access. Um, and then, but what if you're doing the job right? What you should be doing is bringing information to these leaders that they're too busy to hmm. they and can't don't have a big staff. They can't manage it all. Um, I learned in that actually from a more senior lobbyist who shared this with me, um, always tell both sides, like you had me do earlier today, um, because then they're going to hear the other side, but you'll have presented both sides and given the argument why yours is the better side. And so I, I ended up viewing part of my role as actually serving the member who we were advocating to of informing them of what the circumstances and the facts are. Um, and I... I wouldn't get hired for everything because people pick me to go do conservative things, right? right. Um, but I, I, I knew that I would not be successful if people thought I wasn't telling them the truth. So I, I told my clients, we will always present the truth. Right, right. We're not going to fuzz uh, on the issues yeah. here. And so if you don't want the truth told, then we won't go see them. You, you need another have, counselor. Yeah. <laughs> or you don't have to tell them, but I'm not going to tell them something that's false. That's right. Yep. And then I thought I could win every battle, right? Um, sometimes it's better for people to not engage and solve it in a different way. And so I also learned that, the, the humility of, you know, you don't have to go fight every battle. Sometimes it's better to let things work you themselves out. You can walk out. away from some things. Yeah. So, Mr. Counselor, Mr. Advocate, let's just say that Donald John Trump called you up and said, I need some advice right now. Uh, could you speak to be my counselor? What would you say to him? Um, hmm. Very good question. And and we he and I have talked frequently about our candidates, and and so I I tell him who I think are good people. But for advice for him, um, I think it would be to put the election behind him. Um, and I think I see him doing more and more of that. Um, he believes it was stolen. And, and is you think he authentically had, believes that I do it was taken from him taken unfairly unfairly and to to accept that that's happened and then think about how he can continue the mission he started in the new role of former president um, and and I actually see him moving in that direction he he gave a speech at that same event that I was at but that would be my advice um, and. It's it's advice that I had to live by myself. <laughs> so you, I've, I've lost. I've been and, here. <laughs> I've been there, uh, Mr. President. I'm not talking out of a vacuum. Yeah, yeah. And and that if you nurse the defeat, it gnaws at you. If you accept it and move on, then then you have more life and more mission. Yeah. Free. Well, uh, let's take the other side. Joseph R. Biden yeah. says, you know, I was talking to my friend Ty. Yeah, <laughs> he said, "You know, you just need to hear uh, from another voice." Uh, and so I thought I'd just give you a call. Uh, what would you advise me? I would say, first of all, I want you to succeed. Um, and we were on opposite sides. I want you to succeed because it's so important for our country that you succeed. And then I would advise him. Often, the tone and the way you talk about the opponents, sounds like you're yelling at them and lecturing them. I, I sometimes feel that way. And, and I think part of it is he wants to appear energetic because he's been criticized as being yes, older. Sir, yeah. um, so be careful and don't yell at, at the other side because most of them want you to succeed also, even if they're working on, in, in the other party. Um, and almost what my grandmother would have said, you can catch more flies with honey than vinegar, sure, sure. right? Um, so that would be my advice to him. And, and also that there is a large body of people in America today who feel that the system doesn't work for them. And if you run your government to satisfy every constituency that helped get you elected, typically that's a coalition of elite, wealthy 
suburbanites and minorities, but specifically the black community. You can satisfy their needs and desires, but if you don't find a way of bringing along the rest of the country into that so they feel that the system works for them, we're going to have even more divide. Um, and Republicans didn't really repair that divide in the last four years. He has an opportunity to, but it but it's easier to just play to your own base. And, and so I'd advise them, think about the needs of those groups of people who feel like the system doesn't work for them. What do you think is the greatest challenge the country faces right now? I, I'm very interested in an idea that Ben Sass shared with me at, at dinner. And it, it's, I think he had a fancy word like disintermediation. <laughs> um, but, but it's essentially that we are going through a transformational phase. Um, we're, we're, living at a time where relationships are defined digitally as much as in person. Um, and he analogized it to the re Industrial Revolution, where we went from farming and in communities to cities. And there was a breakdown of the family, there was a breakdown of community. He sees that same breakdown occurring. And so the challenge for us, and, and I asked him, okay, so what happened, you're a historian, what happened in the 1900s? He said, well, People reformed communities and churches and families, and, and that's what stabilized the country, and we went into the 20th century. Um, and, and so I think the biggest challenge for us today as a country is to go through that process and come out on the other end with relationships and, and intact families, intact communities. Um, for those of us who are believers, I think God points the way to doing that, right? Um, but... Oftentimes, what I've seen in, in our church, and you've blessed me as being my pastor for so many years in, in, here in Anderson, um, is that, that there's enormous pressure in the church to conform to the, the culture. And if, we, if we're not careful, we're not adding salt and light to the culture. The culture is taking over us. And so I think there's a great mission for the church in that change, rapid change of community and relationships and who we are uh, to speak truth into it, that we are children of God um, and we can come together and love each other. It may have been the old way of, of giving them a fish or it may be today the modern way of finding a way to express love in a posting on Instagram. Um, but there has to be a way found. There has to be a way found. Yeah, And, and the church can lead and point to that. And at points of, of change and unsettled consciousness, you know, when people, they're looking for anchors. I mean, that's my predicate. Yeah, that's uh, that right. In a world of exponential change, and I'm not sure what's next. Uh, I'm looking for an anchor, and the church can be that. And, and we live in a war fallen world, right? So some things might appear to be an anchor that, that are not. They're false gods. They're... they're I think of this conspiracy theory, QAnon, that looks to me like a cult. Um, but, but for some people who haven't been in church, oh, I can belong to that. And, and there's a Messiah figure and, and there's a hope for the future in, in this. And, and so we have to be aware of those false gods and, and make sure people don't get sucked into that. Well, and I think there are some church people drawn into the QAnon uh, sphere. Yeah. But I'm hearing you say you think it's bogus. I do. I think it's fiction and, and designed in a way to look like a religion. So fascinating, though. I mean, where did it come from? I mean, it's it, it designed to look like a religion, and yet it, by whom? <laughs> there, there, I found an interesting article on Google that talks about some of the original people that consciously created it. Um, and, and they did it to promote their, their uh, standing in social media. Well, there's an idea. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe we'll move on to R. <laughs> <laughs> David McIntosh, always glad to see you. And, Likewise. Uh, By the way, can I tell one more story? Of course. So when you were out there visiting me in Washington, we were on the House floor, if you remember. Yes. Um, and you observed something that I hadn't noticed, that on the House floor there are friezes of great lawgivers throughout history. And you pointed up to the one of Moses and observed that he was the only one facing down, looking on the floor in the house. 
and, and you turned to me as, as my pastor and, and said, David, he's, that represents that God is always watching, that what you create for our law doesn't stray too far from God's law. And I've remembered that ever since. So yeah. thank you. Thank you for remembering it. Could you write a note to my children to say, would you remember some of the stuff your dad told you? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Don't we hope, right? <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks for your heart and uh, your place, for your investment and your willingness to uh, sacrifice and thank you. for pouring into a new generation. Thank you. Oh, I love it. And, and do it prayerfully. God's been blessing me. Amen. God's be. For more information, visit allthattosay.org. Thank you for joining the conversation. Don't forget to like and subscribe.